After going through our viewer comments for the first six episodes, we found two topics that were close enough in content together that we decided to combine them and tackle them both. This episode is going to be split into two parts. The first deals with a five-year-old fantasy Musk has brought up repeatedly regarding terraforming Mars, and the second hopefully settles a debate that has erupted on our channel regarding the explosive potential of a Starship RUD. Although we're pretty sure Musk first heard about terraforming Mars by watching old Schwarzenegger movies that turned Mars from a radioactive dust bowl into a lush Earth 2.0, the fiction of that fallacy seems to have escaped him. Since 2015, Musk has been flogging an idea that he will be able to nuke Mars to warm up the planet, which would in turn release greenhouse gases to create an atmosphere that would then be modified into something Earthlings could live in without requiring spacesuits. And there's pretty much nothing in that entire thought process that would be accurate or based in reality. First, let's start with the number of nuclear bombs Musk is proposing it would take to facilitate his little thought experiment. One, maybe 10, how about 10,000? And not just 10,000 nukes, they would all have to be maximum payload devices. City killers. Now, let's compare the size of that required arsenal to the current inventory of nuclear weapons stockpiled here on planet Earth. Across the entire planet, there are nine countries that have created nuclear weapons of various yields. Of the 15,000 devices currently in service or in process of being decommissioned, the US and Russia have 90% of them neither of them with the 10,000 or more that Musk says he would require, so his chances of moving enough of these weapons off-world seems unlikely, since both superpowers would have to give their nuclear arsenals to a single private citizen. Even if Musk could convince them, considering he's been talking with the Russians about buying ICBMs since 2001, these won't do what he thinks they will, and for a couple of reasons. Musk's impression is that these devices will warm up the negative 60 degrees Celsius atmosphere of Mars significantly enough to melt the Martian polar ice caps. What he probably doesn't realize is that here on planet Earth, we have already set off over 2,000 nuclear weapons with no significant global impact. There's a very cool video on YouTube that depicts this timeline from 1945 to 1998, pretty much non-stop explosions for decades. As reported on ARS Technica, a pair of researchers named Bruce Joukowsky and Christopher Edwards took all the available data for Mars's polar ice caps, which Musk intends to target with the nukes, to determine if there was enough frozen carbon dioxide and water ice located at the poles to significantly increase the atmospheric greenhouse gas content and atmospheric pressure as a means to kickstart a self-generating cycle for the atmosphere. They found that if the nuclear weapons managed to liberate all of the polar ice and frozen carbon dioxide layers at both poles, this would roughly double the current atmospheric concentration from 0.6% of Earth's atmosphere to 1.5%. Since that obviously was not going to do the trick, the duo continued using speculation by assuming there are other deposits located across the planet in ground ice containing methane or carbon dioxide gases in a structure called clathrates. Releasing these clathrates would require strip mining the entire surface of the planet, roughly the same surface as the land mass on Earth. And their calculations determined that even if the entire planet was covered in those unlikely deposits, the absolute best case scenario was a mere 15% of Earth's atmospheric pressure. Realistically, they determined those 10,000 nukes might triple the current atmospheric pressure to just under 2% of Earth, which would add 10 degrees Kelvin of greenhouse warming effect, which still only brings the average temperature of the planet up to a chilly minus 50 C. Let's say Musk gets the nukes to Mars. Let's say they magically do the trick and create some additional atmospheric pressure. Right away, that extra material in the Martian atmosphere is going to get peeled off into space. See, Mars had an atmosphere at one time that was apparently warm and dense enough with enough atmospheric pressure to sustain a liquid water cycle complete with rivers and lakes which required rainfall. That atmosphere was held to the planet by a magnetosphere, and that magnetosphere was created by a molten iron core, but Mars's core died about 4 billion years ago. Once that happened, and the magnetosphere dimmed, solar winds stripped the atmosphere off the planet like a power washer. Atmospheric nitrogen, one of the most abundant elements in the universe, is conspicuously absent on Mars. 
and it's likely Mars's supply was lost to space, along with whatever water vapor didn't freeze into permafrost at the poles. Neither of those necessary compounds are going to be recoverable. To summarize, Mars has no active core, so Mars has no magnetosphere, so Mars can't maintain an atmosphere, so no matter how many nukes Musk brings to the party, Mars is not getting terraformed with nuclear weapons. Sorry to burst your bubble. At the end of episode 5, we took the calculated potential energy of a fully fueled starship and super heavy combo and converted it into kilotons for a comparison to the Hiroshima nuclear device. Then we plugged that information into the nuke map simulator on nuclearsecrecy.com to see what type of damage such a blast would do to cities like New York or Washington DC. Although it was mostly tongue in cheek, there is also a great deal of truth in the premise that a starship that either crashed while launching or blew up on the pad would cause a similar amount of damage as the fireball and blast radius of a small nuclear device without the radiation that accompanies a nuclear detonation. That being said, some of our viewers looked at our claims and offered their own take on what would actually happen, where we used the term detonation, others used the terms deflagration and conflagration. The short definitions of those terms are as follows. A detonation is an explosion that is supersonic. A deflagration is an expansion that is subsonic, and a conflagration is a fire that simply causes a lot of damage. While it's true any form of RUD would result in a conflagration and a great deal of damage, this debate revolves around whether or not an RUD would be a subsonic deflagration or a supersonic detonation with a blast radius and further collateral damage. The propellant in Starship is proposed to be methane, also known as CH4, but more commonly known as natural gas. It is mixed with liquid oxygen, known as LOX or LOX, so that it can be burned in space in a vacuum. The explosive potential of methane was explored by US and Canadian Armed Forces in a post-World War II experiment called Project Distant Plane, looking for more convenient ways to test installations and vehicles against the blast from nuclear weapons without using, well, nuclear weapons. One such well-documented test was called Operation Sailor Hat, where Navy vessels were anchored off the shore of Hawaii to get hit broadside from the shockwave produced by detonating 500 tons, or half a kiloton, of TNT. That shockwave was easily tracked across the water as it smacked into the ships at anchor. Project Distant Plane was established to find a better source of shockwaves than detonating small mountains of TNT. One of the considerations was gigantic balloons filled with methane as an easily acquired explosive gas but the balloons tore too easily or detonated prematurely, so neither of the three attempts resulted in any readings and the gas was abandoned due to its instability. The largest non-nuclear explosion on record is in fact a rocket. In July of 1969, the Russians were racing the Americans to the moon and their rocket of choice was called the N-1. All four of the Soviet N-1 vehicles exploded at various stages of launch, but it's the second one that's the most infamous. The N-1, in its entirety, in four stages, contained about 680 tons of kerosene, or RP-1, and 1,780 tons of liquid oxygen. According to Wikipedia, when this 30-engine behemoth came crashing back to Earth at a 45-degree angle, the resulting explosion leveled the launch complex, threw shrapnel 10 kilometers away, and even half an hour later, droplets of burning fuel continued to rain down from the sky. Two important things to note about this accident, as violent as this explosion was, it could have been much worse, as not only did 85% of the propellant not initially explode, likely due to the separation of stages and vessels, but the RP-1 kerosene and the LOX did not have a chance to coagulate into a gel, which would have made this disaster a worst case scenario for destruction. The kiloton estimates for this explosion ranged from 1 to over 7, which would have been half of a Hiroshima nuke. Had those chemicals all combined at once into the gel, it would have been orders of magnitude more destructive. Comparing the N-1 and Starship, what was the largest rocket in the Soviet arsenal, is overshadowed by the proposed Starship specs, standing at 105 meters high compared to the 118 meters high Starship Super Heavy combo. These designs are nothing alike, but one major difference between them is that the N-1 had eight smaller pressurized fuel vessels in the design in their four stages. Starship has two per stage for a total of four, and they are massive by any comparison, since they hold almost exactly twice the mass of propellants. Also, 
where the N1 had complete separation between the RP-1 and the LOX vessels, the Starship has common bulkheads, which will rupture if the ship changes shape in any way. It is far more likely that a Starship explosion would consume all the fuel of each stage at the same time. Now the question remains, is that a deflagration or a detonation? And the answer is, it can be both. There is no shortage of articles dedicated to deflagration to detonation research, and we can demonstrate the difference between the two using the failed Falcon 9 static fire of March 2016. According to the official SpaceX report, while the craft was getting fueled up, cryogenic temperatures caused fissures in a COPV tank, allowing chilled oxygen to leak into an area where electronics were housed. A spark then ignited this oxygen, causing an explosion outside the LOX tank, breaching the propellant tank containing the liquid RP-1. That fuel caught fire and fell along the rocket to the ground in a deflagration. Shortly afterwards, the upper stage fell to the ground, bursting open both tanks, resulting in an explosion that threw shrapnel for hundreds of yards and destroyed the Cape Canaveral's launch pad 40, which required 15 months to rehabilitate. Looking at the Dragon 9 next to the Super Heavy Starship combo makes one realize how very small the Dragon is in comparison. This explosion, as bad as it seemed, only consumed 112 tons of RP-1 kerosene and LOX. The detonation velocity for petrochemicals in an oxygen-rich atmosphere is 1800 meters per second, or Mach 5.25, supersonic. So that is a detonation, not a deflagration. Using the May 29, 2020 footage of SN4 exploding with pretty much empty tanks after a static fire test, you can see how quickly the launch pad went from venting gas to hell on earth. And at this point of the clip, you can see the shock wave reaching upwards as water vapor in the air is compressed into visible bands, as well as the shrapnel being thrown hundreds of yards away, including into the black water towers on site, which did not escape injury. A loud boom was heard, so by all measures, this was a detonation. In the end, whether the craft deflagrates or detonates will likely depend upon how the incident occurs, comparing small leaks versus ground impacts, for example. Another possibility could be the occurrence of what is called a blevy, short for boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. This occurs when a pressurized vessel is heated beyond safety limits, where liquid petroleum expands and boils within the vessel, building up pressure until the vessel yields, resulting in an explosion that throws off tremendous energy and heat capable of producing third degree burns miles away from the fireball. These blevies were all from rail cars full of petroleum products, and you can see the devastation they are capable of producing. A typical rail tank car measures approximately 18 meters long with roughly a 3 meter diameter. How does a rail car compare in size to the super heavy booster? Well, it's already on the diagram. The spacecraft is 9 meters wide, and the tanker car is around 18 meters long, so this is how it would look right beside it. Now, not as a volume comparison, but to demonstrate the height, it would take 23 tankers stacked atop each other just to reach the stage separation between Starship and Super Heavy. The reason why blevies are so devastating is because the liquid inside is boiled into becoming pressurized gas that is suddenly released and ignited. The Starship propellants, however, are chilled liquids under pressure that boil immediately upon contact with air. They require no additional heat at all to boil, and in Starship, they are contained by relatively thin stainless steel, not sturdy, welded industrial vessels. In the end, for now, this debate is open for speculation on both sides of the sound barrier, but the longer SpaceX chases their dreams of putting Starship into orbit, the more likely that we will see firsthand what type of destruction and exploding Starship can dispense. Just as we were finalizing the content for this episode, a massive explosion rocked the port area of Beirut in Lebanon, one that sent out a powerful shock blast that destroyed the storage facility where the initial fire or conflagration started. Several deflagrations were seen igniting through the smoke before a very powerful detonation took out the entire facility. That killed more than 135 people and injured over 5,000 at last count. The cause of the explosion was 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate that had been improperly stored, and reports continuing to come in from all sides just go to show how the same incident can have wildly different estimates, so far ranging from 1 to 3.3 kilotons of TNT. But those reports also confirm conventional explosives are capable of reaching the kiloton marker, 
entering the range of early nuclear weapons. For reference, ammonium nitrate has an energy density of 1.4 megajoules per kilogram and a detonation velocity of 2,550 meters per second. Methane gas has an energy density of 55.6 megajoules per kilogram and a detonation velocity of 1,800 meters per second. And unlike nuclear weapons, which only release 50% of their energy as blast, with 35% released as heat and 15% released as radiation, 100% of conventional explosives go into creating the blast. Which will make for some very interesting fireworks during Starship's eventual and inevitable rapid unscheduled disassembly. Thank you for watching this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic, and as we celebrate our 1,000th subscriber in our first month of broadcast, we are also looking forward to providing enough episodes to take us over the required number of viewing hours with your continued support. Drop your ideas for future episodes as we work towards episode 10, which will be going back through the first nine episodes and taking the five best questions. To have your question considered, hit subscribe and drop it in the comments below.